Good afternoon, everyone. America's current tax code is too costly, too complex, and unfair, but mostly unfair. It's unfair to families, whether you're single or raising children, starting your career or experiencing retirement, the tax code is impossible to understand. It's more time consuming than ever, and you're always wondering, is the next guy paying the same as me? We can't possibly keep up with the 4,000 changes Washington has made the past decade. That's a new change in the tax code every day. Few taxpayers even know the tax provisions to which they are entitled. For example, there are 15 different tax provisions for higher education, each with its own set of rules. The simple guide for these provisions in higher education is 90 pages long. And if you accidentally make a mistake, the IRS is unforgiving. Today's tax code is unfair to businesses. It costs too much for businesses to keep up with their taxes, especially if you're a small business. Most have to rely on outside tax preparers. It's not fair that many small businesses pay higher tax rate than big businesses. It's not fair that American companies face the highest tax rate among developed countries. Our outdated tax code often double taxes American companies, forcing them to shift workers and research overseas just to try to compete on a level playing field against foreign competitors. The, today's tax code is unfair to America. The complex and burdensome tax code drains over $160 billion out of America's economy each and every year. It makes it too hard to start up new businesses and create new jobs. America has fallen behind its global competitors in Europe and China, saddled with the tax code that costs us sales, contracts, and jobs when we compete. Experts predict that a simpler, fair, flatter tax code for families and businesses could create up to one million new jobs in the first year and make us competitive again in the 21st century. We need a simpler, fair tax code that protects taxpayers, not special interests, and helps America compete and win. So what can we learn from the last comprehensive rewrite of the American tax code? When President Ronald Reagan took office on January 20th, 1981, the top individual income tax rate was 70 percent. The Economic Recovery Tax Act of 1981 reduced the top individual rate to 50 percent by the end of his first term. The Tax Reform Act of 1986 reduced the top individual rate further to 28 percent by the end of his second term. Contrary to the claims of Reagan's critics at the time, these rate reductions neither starved the Treasury for revenue nor undermined the progressivity of the income tax. Income taxes as a share of our economy remain virtually unchanged. The share of income tax paid by the richest Americans increased dramatically. For example, the share of federal income taxes paid by the top 1 percent rose from 19.1 percent in 1980 to 27.6 percent in 1988. In contrast, the federal income tax burden on the middle class fell. Indeed, the share of federal income taxes paid by the bottom 50 percent fell from 7.1 in 1980 to 5.7 percent eight years later. The Tax Reform Act of 1986 reduced the top corporate income tax rate from 46 to 34 percent. But the positive effects of lower corporate rates were largely offset by the repeal of the investment tax credit, longer depreciation schedules, especially for buildings, and the repeal of the 60 percent exclusion of capital gains from taxation effectively raising the top tax rate on capital gains from 20 to 28 percent. The tax reforms enacted under President Reagan were not perfect, yet collectively they boosted economic growth and employment. Tax changes in Reagan's first term increased real GDP by more than 10 percent, while tax changes in his second term partially offset these earlier gains by less than 1 percent. The overall success of Reagan's tax policies brought about a worldwide revolution in taxation. Over the next two and a half decades, nearly every developed country in the world reduced tax rates on both individuals and corporations. The average combined corporate tax rate among the countries in the OECD declined from approximately 40 percent in the early 1980s to 25 percent last year. And after Japan recently cut its corporate income tax rate, the United States regret regrettably now has the highest combined corporate tax rate among our global competitors at 39.2 percent. It is the worst. 
Despite President Obama's individual income and capital gains tax rate increases in January, which have slowed the U.S. economic recovery, the President still asserts the wealthy are not paying their fair share of federal taxes. However, the facts just don't support this assertion. An objective study by the OECD found the highest earning 10 percent of the U.S. population actually paid the largest share among 24 countries examined, even after adjusting for their relatively higher incomes. The richest 10 percent in the United States pay 1.35 times their share of income taxes compared to the OECD average of just 1.11. Taxation, quote, taxation is most progressively distributed in the United States, end quote, the OECD study concluded. Unfortunately, as other countries have moved forward in reducing their individual and corporate income tax rates, the United States has reversed course on doing much of the earlier rate reductions. Including President Obama's latest tax increases, our top individual tax rate is now nearly 44 percent. The purpose of today's hearing is to review the lessons we should have learned from previous tax reform. What worked, what didn't, and why. And most importantly, given our anemic recovery from the current recession, the weakest recovery since World War II, how can we improve our tax system to get the most economic bang for the buck? What I've seen as a member of the Tax, Rating House, uh, tax Writing House Ways and Means Committee is our current complex tax system diverts productive resources into wasteful lobbying and tax avoidance schemes, favors consumption over investment, debt over equity, large businesses over small, and some industries over others. Tax reform should eliminate these distortions and promote economic growth. Hopefully today's hearing will help us identify the steps we need to take to achieve this goal. Look for the testimony of our witnesses, and I would note that the Vice Chair, Senator Klobuchar, is voting uh, this moment when she returns. We will take a moment to have her read her opening statement as well. So let me introduce those who are here uh, today. Mr. James Gilmore currently serves as President and CEO of the Free Congress Foundation, an entity that offers bipartisan conservative solutions to various domestic and national security challenges. He also oversees operations, uh, o o uh, operates Gilmore Global Group, LLC, in which he consults with companies seeking to market goods and services throughout the world. Mr. Gilmore has served as the 68th Governor of Virginia, as Chairman of the Congressional Advisory Panel to assess domestic response capabilities for terrorism involving weapons of mass destruction, known as the Gilmore Commission. This panel was influential in developing the Office of Homeland Security. Governor Gilmore is a graduate of the University of Virginia and the University of Virginia School of Law. Welcome. Dr. Lori, Loria DeAndre Tyson is a professor of global management at the Haas School of Business, the University of California, Berkeley. She's a member of the Brookings Institution Hamilton Project Advisory Council, member of the MIT Corporation. Dr. Tyson is a member of, the Pre of President Ob Barack Obama's Economic Recovery Advisory Board. Previously, she served as President Clinton's National Economic Advisor and the 16th Chairman of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Dr. Tyson has a summa cum laude an undergraduate degree from Smith College and a doctorate in economics from MIT. Welcome, Doctor. Dr. Kevin Hassett is the John G. Searle Senior Fellow and Director of Economic Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. He was a senior economist at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, a policy consultant at the Treasury Department during the George H.W. Bush and Clinton administrations. He's written a number of papers on fundamental tax reform and has co-authored a book with renowned economist Glenn Hubbard titled Tax Policy and Investment. He has a BA from Swarthmore and a doctorate in economics from the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome back, Dr. Hassett. Dr. Jane Gravel is currently a senior specialist in economic policy in the Government and Finance Division of the Congressional Research Service. She specializes in economics of taxation, particularly the effects of tax policies on economic growth in resource allocation. She's the author of The Economic Effects of Taxing Capital Income and co-editor of the Encyclopedia of Taxation and Tax Policy. She's also the pre past president of the National Tax Association. I've told you everything I know about our four witnesses today. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for being here. This will be an interesting hearing. Governor Gilmore, you're recognized for five minutes for your opening remarks. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I want to thank the committee 
uh, and ranking members and all the others who uh, have invited us here to this distinguished panel today, and I I'm, I'm appreciate the opportunity to be a part of it. We at Free Congress Foundation are focused on a number of public policy issues, but we think that this committee today is addressing a genuine national crisis. Something has got to be done about growing and restoring the economy of this country and emerging from the Great Recession. We are not emerging from the Great Recession, and something has got to be done about it. Now, this is as current as this morning's news, but first, let me just say that as we look at our uh, historic Free Congress benchmarks, one of those is GDP. I made a note just recently that the gross domestic product growth in this country in December of 2011 was 1 1.8 percent. The growth of the economy in December of 2012 was 1.9 percent. This morning, the report is that our economy is growing at 1.7 percent. Now, we're just standing still. We're just moving sideways in the same direction. The historic growth rate of the United States is 3.2 percent. The gap between 3.2 and 1.8 or 1.7 is dramatic. Always in the history of this country, when we've gone through a recession and dropped below the historic norm, we've always gone back and even above that norm so that we can return back to the proper trajectory of growth. We're not doing it this time. We're not doing it. And everything we are doing is counter growth in this country, so we should not be surprised that we're in this kind of, of position. In the meanwhile, what is the direct impact of this? Well, in, 2000, in April of 2012, 1.5 million of 53% uh, of young people under 25 years of age with bachelor's degrees were either jobless or underemployed. African, we know the unemployment rate's about what, 7.6 right now, Mr. Chairman? Unemployment in the African American community stays at 13.7. Young African Americans are facing unemployment rate of about 22.1 percent. Unemployment in the Hispanic community is likewise above the rate of the country at 13 percent. Women in the United States of America are on a, in an unemployment rate of 11.6 percent. I'm going to take what little time I have and tell you, Mr. Chairman, a quick personal story. I went over recently to the Giant Food in Old Town Alexandria near where I have my office. I wanted to buy a salad for lunch. I'm trying to lose weight like everybody else. And, uh, I couldn't get through the line. I couldn't understand why I couldn't get up to the cash register. And I looked up at the front, and there's a young African-American woman up there about 23 years old. And she's got several items and a cabbage and a couple of things, and she's trying to play for it with a plastic card, which I determined was a food stamp card. And uh, the cashier said, and I used to be a cashier when I got started in my career, said, uh, you don't have enough money on this card to pay this $5 bill. Whereupon, embarrassed, she put aside everything, picked up the cabbage, peeled off two singles out of her wallet and paid for the cabbage, and went on. Now, Mr. Chairman, this is a historic crime on the people of this country, that this government is taking no action to bring us out of this recession. We should have an economy that is so dynamic that even that young woman has a better opportunity in life than what I just described to you. And that is the responsibility of this Congress and of this administration and it isn't being done. We believe and we should think you should concentrate today on t the tax reform as a vehicle for growing the economy. Now, we at Free Congress at freecongress.org have created a plan. We don't think it's the only plan. We think it could be subject to improvement, but the fact is that we've offered a plan that will grow the economy. And right now, everything that's being done in the United States is counter growth. So we should not be surprised that we're in this kind of position and these kinds of impacts are being had on the people of the United States. We believe the emphasis of the Congress, Republican and Democrat, Senate and House, ought to be on growing the economy and creating American opportunity. American opportunity is dependent on growth, growth, growth. And you will not grow this economy through all the devices that we're seeing of the Federal Reserve pumping up the money or stimulus spending that has not worked and will not work because it's just like spinning a top, and when you stop spinning the top, the top falls over. We have to have organic growth, and that comes from investment. And that means that we have to do things in this country to create real investment, and the tax reform can, in fact, achieve that. But Mr. Chairman, I believe that in the 21st century that the United States can continue to play the kind of role that it ought to play. 
that we can have the revenue necessary to be able to do what we have to do without these devices like a sequester or a cutting or increases of taxation which just reduce investment and the kinds of policies that we're following right now. We can have a strong economy, which was the foundation of America's strength in the 20th century. We can do this again. We can have national security that is healthy and robust, and we can have a better quality of life for the American people if the Congress does its job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor. Dr. Tyson? Good afternoon, Chairman Brady, members of the Joint Economic Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about how carefully designed tax reform can improve growth. I agree with the governor, very, very important. I am, as you heard, a professor at the Haas School of Business, University of California, Berkeley. The views in my testimony are my own, but I do serve as an economic advisor to the Alliance for Competitive Taxation, a coalition of American businesses promoting comprehensive corporate tax reform and my remarks will focus on corporate tax reform. As recently as 30 years ago, the American economy was the most competitive in the world. The U.S. could design its corporate tax code without considering the global economic environment. We no longer live in that world. Emerging market economies, falling trade barriers, leaps in technology, have expanded opportunities for American companies, but they've also heightened global competition for American companies and among countries, between the U.S. as a location for investment and Germany as a location for investment, just as an example. Today, our corporate tax system is failing our country. It's reducing the competitiveness of the U.S. economy as a place to do business and create jobs. For example, when a U.S. company sells shampoo in Asia, it competes with shampoos produced by foreign competitors. The price of the shampoo to the foreign consumer has to be competitive. The Dutch company providing the shampoo pays zero tax to the Netherlands on its sales of shampoo in Asia. The U.S. company is subject to U.S. tax on those sales of its product in Asia whenever it chooses to repatriate its foreign earnings to the United States. This system encourages American companies to hold their foreign earnings abroad in order to counter the competitive disadvantage of our current tax system. Now, the good news on corporate taxes, there's widespread bipartisan agreement that the system is flawed and needs fundamental reform. It is bipartisan. After the 1986 overhaul, the United States had the lowest corporate tax rate among OECD countries. Since then, country after country has reduced their rate why? To attract investment. They've left the U.S. with the highest corporate tax rate among developed countries. Cutting the U.S. corporate tax rate to a more competitive level would encourage more investment in the United States by both domestic U.S. companies and by foreign companies. With capital becoming increasingly mobile, national corporate tax rates have a growing influence on where multinational companies locate their operations, locate their jobs, and report their income. Higher investment in the U.S. by both domestic and foreign companies would foster growth, improve productivity, create jobs, boost real wages over time. The pro-growth argument for reducing the U.S. corporate tax rate is compelling, but rate reduction by itself would reduce corporate tax revenues. What to do? Like most economists, I believe we can and should pay for a significant rate reduction in the, cor in the corporate tax by broadening the corporate tax base to eliminate tax breaks and preferences. This approach would reduce the complexity of the corporate tax code, would increase its efficiency by reducing distorting tax differences across economic activities. With 95% of the world's consumers and an increasing share of the world's purchasing power outside of the United States, the U.S. also needs to reform the way it taxes the foreign earnings of U.S. companies. Most other OECD countries have adopted a modern international tax system referred to as a participation exemption or territorial system. It generally allows their internationally engaged companies to compete globally, reinvest their foreign business earnings at home without paying a second tax. The U.S., by contrast, taxes U.S. companies when they bring their foreign earnings to the U.S., and this lies far outside now of the international norms of taxation. To counter this disadvantage, U.S. companies have a strong incentive, as I said, to keep their foreign earnings abroad. And we know now that these companies are holding an estimated $2 trillion in accumulating foreign earnings. 
These earnings are not financing investment and job creation in the United States. The U.S. companies are encouraging efficiency costs from the suboptimal use of their balance sheets and from higher debt levels than would be necessary if they could repatriate these earnings without incurring additional U.S. tax. Preliminary results from a study I'm conducting suggests that a 95 percent participation exemption system in the U.S would increase U.S. employment by about 150,000 jobs a year on a sustained basis, but the upfront effect, the short-term employment gain, would be nearly 10 times larger. And those gains come from the fact that a significant, there would be a significant increase in repatriated flows, and that money would be put to work on investment and consumption in the United States. Now, tax reform does have to address the incentives which U.S. companies have to shift their income to low-tax jurisdictions. These incentives exist in the U.S. tax system, and they exist in foreign tax systems. By itself, lowering the rate in the U.S. would actually reduce income shifting incentives, but more needs to be done. I will just say there are two ways to look for more. Uh, innovative proposal by uh, Chairman David Camp in his tax reform discussion about how to do this based on where products are sold. Now we have the OECD working on a 15-point plan to deal with income shifting and base erosion, I believe we can move to partial exemption system with serious base erosion protections. We need to reform our tax system to be more competitive internationally and to grow jobs at home. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Hassett? Thank you, Chairman Brady and members of the committee. Uh, in my testimony, I attempt to uh, put the current circumstance in more of a historic uh, perspective and uh, analyze the case for tax reform, not just by comparing our rates to other countries' rates and so on, but comparing our current economic experience to our own in the past and that of other countries. I think, uh, it, given that the President Reagan's uh, name is in the title uh, of the hearing, uh, that it was interesting at the beginning to, to look back on August 13, 1981. President Reagan signed into law the Economic Recovery Tax Act of 1981, and it drastically reduced the tax burden on Americans. Uh, those tax cuts were pared back some in 82, but the majority of them survived. And the economic revival that followed was tremendous, as Senator Graham recently detailed in the Wall Street Journal. Within 55 months of the start of the recession, the economy had created 7.8 million more jobs than at its start, and real per capita GDP grew by about $3,000. During the same time frame, the number of people on disability stamps fell 14.3 percent, or about 644,000 people. The number of food stamp recipients fell 13.4 percent, or by about 3 million people. And between 1981 and 1986, real median family income rose 7.7 percent. In my testimony, I document how, uh, while we don't know that all of those uh, good statistics are related to the tax reductions, how that there's a, a, a massive economic literature that supports that there's a positive link. But more troubling, uh, I think that now that we're out of the area where we need to really cons be concerned about demand side factors uh, holding the economy down, uh, in my testimony I start to look at where we are on the supply side factors that uh, drive growth. And my testimony discusses something that, that, as you know, the CBO and the Fed and other forecasters use called uh, potential GDP growth. And the basic idea is that, that if you want to have uh, long-term growth, then you have an output, then you need to have long-term growth in inputs. And if we can project what's going to happen to the growth of inputs, then we have a good base for what output is going to be. Now, if you look at what's happened in the evolution of the growth of inputs, it's really quite troubling. Let's uh, look at the labor force. Growth in the labor force is an important contributor to economic growth, but it's been shrinking in importance over the past decade. At its peak in the 70s, potential hours work contributed 1.7 percentage points to potential GDP growth each year. Uh, potential GDP uh, growth is not exactly what's going to happen, but it's a key driving force of how the supply side is driving the economy forward. From 2002 through 2012, however, hours worked only contributed 0.3 percentage points on average to potential GDP growth. And so if you wonder, like, are we in this new normal where we're going to have low growth? Well, yes, the growth of labor input alone is contributing about 1.4 percentage point less growth per year going forward. Uh, on the capital side, uh, it's about half a percent below where we were. And so what that means is that the underlying growth in inputs that drive the growth of the economy is contributing about 2% per year less than it used to to economic growth. 
in my testimony, I connect uh, these factors uh, to our really uh, often indefensible policies. Uh, we've spoken in this committee before, uh, and the other uh, witnesses also speak quite a bit about corporate reform. Uh, and in my testimony, I go into that in quite detail. But I think that as we're thinking about tax reform, we also have to recognize that, that the big kahuna in terms of the disappointing new normal is that labor force growth is so disappointing. And as my colleagues Aspen Gori and Sita Slavov have explained in a recent analysis, uh, the structure of the tax code in the U.S., which is based on family units rather than individuals, uh, has many disincentives for secondary workers. In addition, our retirement programs like Social Security and, and Medicare have structures that very often discourage participation in the workforce. And if we're going to have a fundamental reform that increases the growth of inputs in a way that we could expect to have higher, higher long-term output, uh, then we need to focus on labor supply as well. On the corporate side, I think that uh, it is absolutely inexcusable that we're about the high tax place on Earth. I think there are a couple of developing countries that are a little bit higher. And it has a, a massive negative effect, I believe, on capital stock growth uh, that firms right now, multinational firms, in response to these high rates and our somewhat liberal transfer pricing rules, locate activity offshore rather than at home, contributing to the shortfall in capital stock growth. I think that as members of this committee discuss why tax reform is urgent to conclude, uh, that it's, it's important to keep in mind the fact that if you look at the tax rate data and so on, we're out of whack. But if you look at the input growth data, the potential GDP calculations, and see that we've basically created a new normal for ourselves where we're going to grow 2% a year less or 1.5% a year less, somewhere in there, because our policies are constraining input growth, uh, then the urgency of tax reform becomes more apparent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Gabel. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, comparing and contrasting the current effort with the 1986 Tax Reform Act, which is often considered a model, can help us to understand the expected effects. TRA, like many current proposals, was to be revenue and distributionally neutral, although currently some proposals propose a revenue gain. The stated objectives of TRA were fairness, simplicity, and economic growth. But much of the initial analysis fo focused on neutrality or efficiency instead. While these terms are sometimes used interchangeably, each is a distinct concept. Economic growth refers to responses that increase income and output. Efficiency refers to reallocating resources to maximize welfare. Many, indeed most, efficiency effects are not detectable as a change in output. They are generally small and may largely reallocate output or risk. Economic growth generally arises from increases in labor supply, savings, and investment. Theory and evidence suggest, however, that TRA did not have much of an effect on growth. This limited effect was expected, in part because supply responses are small, and in part because a revenue-neutral tax reform that included base-broadening offsets might have minimal aggregate effects on effective marginal tax rates. For example, TRA reduced the corporate tax rate and repealed the investment credit. This trade-off contributed to the neutrality of tax burdens across assets, but increased the overall cost of capital because the investment credit applied only to new investment, while the corporate rate reduction provided a windfall for old capital. The same trade-off would likely occur currently with the single largest corporate base broadening provision commonly discussed, accelerated depreciation. Other corporate and individual base broadening provisions would also offset cuts in statutory tax rates and limit the change in effective marginal tax rates. In comparing TRA and current tax reform, some economic aspects, such as concerns about deficits, are similar. Two factors differ substantially, however, from 1986, a lower rate of inflation and a more integrated worldwide economy. Thus, some issues, such as indexing capital income for inflation, may be less important today. However, the open economy and international investment flows, given relatively little attention in 1986, is now central to proposals to lower the corporate tax rate. Artificial shifting of profits to low-tax countries has also become a major compliance issue. TRA is widely seen as a model for reform. And while TRA made major dramatic changes on the corporate side, its individual base broadening was actually somewhat limited. Uh, currently, the TRA corporate, rate, corporate reforms, however, have left little low-hanging fruit. The repeal of the investment credit at that time financed almost all of the 12 percentage point 
rate reduction, but eliminating accelerated depreciation today would allow a rate reduction of two to three percentage points. It would also increase the cost of capital. Rates could be reduced by only, in the long run, steady state, by only five percentage points, I estimate, if every corporate tax expenditure other than deferral for and source income were eliminated. And without spending, having a lot of time to talk about the individual side, the same issues occur on the individual side when you change deductions that are marginal and trade them off for statutory tax rates, you may not accomplish very much. Turning to the treatment of foreign source income, with current estimates, eliminating the deferral, which has gotten a lot larger, would offset a corporate rate reduction of almost four percentage points. Increasing the capital stock in the United States somewhat through both the lower rate and the removal of the incentive for U.S. firms to invest abroad. It would also eliminate the benefit of profit shifting and, of course, the problem of repatriation uh, restrictions. Although these are traditional solutions, there is also a very strong interest in the Congress in moving in the other direction to a territorial tax. A pure territorial tax would make profit shifting more attractive, but these proposals have contained anti-abuse provisions to address this issue. So a central issue is how clear, how, how effective these anti-abuse provisions might be. Although TRA increased corporate taxes in order to cut individual taxes, a significant share of that revenue gain was actually transitory in part because of timing effects. There is a similar issue with current tax reform if provisions like accelerated depreciation are adopted or if movement to a territorial ta tax is financed with transitory revenues from a one-time repatriation holiday. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hassett. Um you know, thinking about the lessons from President Reagan's tax reforms and the impact, today we have uh, a code that's actually more progressive, even though the rate is lower, more and more people are paying on, on the upper earner, earner side. We have a lower, uh, low bracket at 10% rather than 15%. Well, one of the biggest changes is how many businesses are filing as individuals, as S-corps, as pass-throughs, as partnerships and all. Some have suggested that we only do, as a country, for economic growth corporate only tax reform, but given a view of how much of our job growth occurs on the individual side, how critical is it that we do both? Uh, thank you, Mr. Brady. The, the individual side is very important. As, as you know, that there's an enormous share of aggregate business income now that goes through the individual code. Uh, if we have, however, a, a very solid, smart corporate tax reform, then uh, we would expect, uh, based on analysis in the literature by economists such as Roger Gordon and others, uh, that there would be a lot of change of organizational form. If we made the corporate tax code really attractive, uh, then people might decide to organize their business less through the individual side. I think that's an important consideration if one starts to be constrained, and I'm not an expert on this, and I know, I know the members of the committee are, by political realities that suggest that maybe you have to deal with the corporate reform all by itself. If you have a really good corporate reform, the organizational form issues, I think most economists believe, will kind of work themselves out. From a job creation standpoint, in the role business investment plays, buildings, equipment, software, how critical is it that in addition to low rates that the after-tax cost of capital be also low from the standpoint of much of our economy uh, from energy on. The goal is to rate. It, it takes a large amount of capital uh, invested, quickly recovered, and reinvested as well. Very key to that job creation. How? What lessons should we keep in mind as we go forward? It, it, it makes me, and, and here I concur with Dr. Gravel, who, who, by the way, I first met when she discussed a paper of mine on this topic on the investment tax credit repeal of the 86 Tax Act. I remember was, that. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, it's a concern that Dr. Gravel and I both share, that, uh, that if, if you're going to uh, cut the corporate rate, then the reduction in the corporate rate benefits both old capital, say a company that's making a lot of money today based on investments they made in the past, uh, they'll pay less tax this year. And it will also benefit new capital because if you make an investment that pays off, then when you ultimately earn profits on it, you'll pay a lower rate. Uh, but the depreciation is only available to somebody who invests in a new machine. If it, like at the margins starting right now, it's the depreciation that I get if I buy a new machine uh, that in, has an influence on my decision. And so if we have a revenue neutral reform that increases the, the tax on new capital, 
uh, and then reduces the tax on new and old capital, then it necessarily on net has to increase the tax on new capital. And in the kind of models that I've used throughout my career, the kind of model that Dr. Cavell used throughout her career perhaps as well, at least the career since, since we started interacting, uh, that could be a negative for growth if you're not careful. All right. Thank you, Doctor. Dr. Tyson, um, given the competitive climate we're in worldwide, um, is it possible to remain competitive and have a pro-growth tax code retaining a worldwide form of taxation for corporations? I do not think we should. I think that uh, what we have in our worldwide system, we have a worldwide system which has a lot of particular features mm -hmm. which have uh, encouraged and allowed our companies to overcome the competitive disadvantage associated with the worldwide system essentially by taking advantage of deferral and other options to keep we've, money outside. We've tied ourselves in So basically we get no revenue, we, get, we don't get the money for financing investment and employment in the United States, so we get none of the, of the, the, the benefits. A territorial moving to a partial exemption system with some serious base erosion yeah. and uh, Dr. Hazard and I agree on this. We're going to get, we get rid of the competitive disadvantage our firms face. We get rid of the competitive disadvantage of locating here, and we get some of the, and we get the benefits there of competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. It just seems in this world that when our companies compete and win overseas and have profits, we have a tax gate preventing them from bringing them back and reinvesting in U.S. jobs. U.S. research, U.S. growth Absolutely. makes no sense at all. It makes no sense. Thank you. Governor, I want to ask you the lesson to us um, from your experience as we go forward in tax reform. Is there one key message we ought to take, keep, keep in mind as we pursue this? Yes, sir. First of all, uh, I happen to agree with Dr. Tyson about this issue of the repatriation of, of capital. Um, I have been personally involved with corporations that have uh, been very proud of the fact that they've moved their capital overseas so that they can increase their reports to their shareholders, and they're rather happy about it because they understand that they're tax advantaged by going overseas. That's something that has to be changed and has to be repaired. If we can bring the money back for our companies to get them invested in the United States, why do we insist on penalizing that? I agree with Dr. Tice. Now, secondly, if you ask me a question, oh, let me also mention also that uh, as part of our, our growth code, we think an innovation would be to break up this, 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 this distinction between small businesses and individuals and corporations, you can tax all people on business activity the same and eliminate this pass through where small businesses are disadvantaged in passing through to higher individual tax brackets. That's part of an over overall program which we've developed called the Growth Code on our website. You asked me a question, Mr. Chairman, and I congratulate you, by the way. I think you're one of the one of the congressmen who actually understands what's going on around here, and we appreciate very much your having this hearing to push this forward and to do this. There's a one question, uh, one, one point. It is this. Net growth must become the national goal of the United States of America, and we should not do anything that discourages it. We should do everything we can do to encourage it, at least until we get the revenue going again. And what have we done? Well, we've raised taxes on the higher brackets to make sure that the people don't invest, even though you won't see the revenue because they can, they can get away from that. We have increased the taxes on capital gains to make sure nobody will create any capital gains. Uh, you're not going to see any revenue from that, but we're discouraging the investment. We've done a sequester. We've done an Obamacare, which makes sure small businesses can increase their employees over 49 people. And amazingly, we have allowed a payroll tax on every wage earner in the United States to make sure that consumption goes down. We have done everything as a national policy to discourage growth, and we have done nothing to encourage growth. My message is that that must become the national challenge. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Representative Delaney. Thank you, uh, Chairman Brady, for holding this uh, important hearing, and I want to thank all of our guests for their testimony and for their work on behalf of these issues. Uh, I think at this point uh, the testimony was very clear around the need for corporate tax reform, which I almost view as unassailable at this point. Uh, the case is so persuasive. The case is so obvious. Uh, the debate to whether it's 25 or 28, everyone has agreed on what the standard should be. 
which is uh, revenue neutral, and we should get on with getting it done. And it is really an important issue for U.S. competitiveness. It also seems to me there's two components, particularly around the international system. The first is how do we change the tax code, which we always do on a prospective basis, so that the unintended outcomes that currently exist with all this cash accumulating overseas does not continue. And let's assume we agree on that at some point. The second thing is what do we do with the money that's over there? How do we create ways of bringing that money back in a way that is, that is consistent with a pro-growth agenda, which is one of the reasons I've put forth bipartisan legislation to have that money used to invest in our infrastructure as a way of investing in a pro-growth economy that does not cost the taxpayers money because that money's not coming back now. And I do care a lot about this competitiveness issue that this country faces. And I think we have to think of it not necessarily through a through the lens of what's happened across the last 20 or 25 years, although it should inform the way we think about the world, we really have to think about what's going to happen in the next 20 or 25 years. And the macro trends in the world, globalization and technology, are going to continue to put pressure on the United States from a competitiveness standpoint. And there's many things we need to do there. I, I just touched on infrastructure. But this notion of investment is really, really important. And it seems to me that switching now to our capital gains tax, because I want to drill down on that for a, for a minute or two, and maybe, Dr. Tyson, I'll put the question to you first. It seems to me that right now there are two types of investments that in professional investors make. They make investments in companies that, by and large, don't need them, which is the largest companies in this country are all awash in cash. They have more liquidity than they've ever had. They're all increasing their dividends and buying back stock, which is terrific. But we don't necessarily need to create an incentive for people to invest in those type of transactions, because they're not really capital formation transactions. Put more directly, someone buying Apple stock, holding it for 12 months and selling it, is not really necessarily stimulative to the economy. It's, it is in a nuanced way, because if they make money, they have more money to spend, et cetera. But then there's the whole category of the investments that really create jobs in this country investing in startup businesses, mid-sized businesses, which actually really create all the jobs, infrastructure, things like that. They're long-tail investments. You typically need to have a long-term investment horizon on those investments because of the nature of what they do. Would you be in favor of a capital gain system that actually raised taxes uh, for short-term capital gains but lowered it as the investment horizon was deferred three, five, seven years, potentially down to zero? so that we really have a game-changing view of how people allocate capital and are much more focused on allocated capitals to start up to fast-growing mid-sized businesses to other long-dated assets like infrastructure. So maybe Dr. Tyson. Well, I did say that I was focusing primarily on corporate tax reform, so let me start by at least linking that question to your question, because I have observed in past things that I've written that countries around the world, as they've shifted and reduce their corporate tax rates have tended to offset some of the revenue losses in two different ways. One is by uh, adjusting their, capital, their treatment of capital gains uh, and dividends mm -hmm. and the taxation of that. So moving the taxation from the level of the business entity, the corporation, to the owners. Countries around the world have done that. So we've been moving in the opposite direction. We raise the rate on the corporations and then lower the rates on the individuals. Yep. The second thing is countries have to go to the accelerated depreciation point have observed that for large multinational companies looking for big investments around the world, future investment, accelerated depreciation doesn't matter as much as statutory corporate <coughs> rate differences. So that they are saying, get rid of all the deductions, including accelerated depreciation. We are going to be able to deal with uh, being competitive. All of our competitive disadvantages will go away if we have a corporate rate with territoriality. Look, on the issue of capital gains, it has long been discussed among economists, and I remember discussing it in the Clinton administration, that there is a desire that if you're looking at capital gains, it is perfectly reasonable to think about adjusting the rates with the duration of holding the asset. So I, I don't – this is an argument which I will turn over to Kevin, but, but basically economists have looked at this and right. thought, hmm, this might be something to do to encourage longer holding periods. Dr. Hassett, very quickly. Uh, I, I'm, I'm wary of uh, term uh, differences in rates because you don't want to have the government you know, make people hold stuff for, for a given amount of time. Everybody should be making the decision based on the economic optimality of going here versus there. And so I think whatever rate you decide should apply uh, pretty much across the board. I, I would like well, – yes, I, I agree. I, th I think that, that the lock-in effect is pretty well established uh, and that it's not necessarily something that uh, supports economic efficiency. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Representative Hanna. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Dr. Gravel, the conversation is simple around here uh, and long in the tooth. We want to uh, level the tax uh, field, uh, eliminate deductions, and uh, lower the rate. But clearly, uh, you don't think that the rate we want, may want to lower it to whoever we are uh, is possible in as much as you said that uh, uh, eliminating all the deductions is someplace between 3 and 5 percent. So are, and I'm not asking anybody this, does this mean our mission is impossible already? Well, I, you know, I think it's pretty tough. I mean, I think when you start with I want this rate instead of I want these tax changes, mm -hmm and what that rate will lead to, that's when you can get yourself to something that you want that can't happen. Now, there's, uh, there's some things outside of tax expenditures that you could consider. Uh, one of them I mentioned in my testimony was, was uh, uh, restricting deductions for interest or disallowing the part that reflects inflation. Uh, there's other sort of non-tax expenditure-based broadeners like capitalizing advertising. There are things like that that you could think of. But even with those, it seems to be very hard. If you, you could do what the Wyden Gregg bill did, but they had a, you know, they ended deferral. Without ending deferral, if that's off the table, then it's very hard to imagine, for me, to see a combination of provisions that will let you have a 25% rate, corporate rate, Dr. under Tyson? revenue neutral. Thank you. I think it's it's very difficult, but I do think that uh, one of the reasons I was uh, agreed to to be an economic advisor to this alliance, and actually Doug Holzik and my Republican counterpart also agreed, is because we we were convinced by work that is ongoing uh, in in the Congress that that I, I believe. Um, Congressman Camp and Max, Senator Baucus are, are leading and working with companies to really say, all right, I, we want a certain rate. Can we get to it? And if we can get to it, are we willing to give up all the things that we need to give up to get to it? And I've been struck by the fact that there is a very strong view uh, in the business community that indeed there is a path to get to a reform which leads to a significant rate reduction that is revenue neutral and, and revenue neutral in two senses. It's revenue neutral on the domestic rate reduction, eliminate uh, 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 credits and preferences. It's also by uh, dealing with the transition tax on the repatriated earnings that are sitting outside right now and going forward, you can actually get rid of deferral and make a territorial exemption system with base erosion protection, which does not lose revenue. Now, so there, so I think we should work hard. This is a this is the challenge. The those are ideal features of a corporate tax reform you would want. Let's see if we can get there. Many many people in the United States who work on these issues regularly believe that we can. That's the challenge to. Uh, the Congress to work to see if we can. Thank you. Do you, go, go ahead, uh, Governor. Uh, Congressman, just very quickly, we at we Free Congress uh, uh, put together a program working with an economist we call the Growth Code. I would encourage your staff to look at it at uh, freecongress.org. It's got five elements, plan, comprehensive, revenue neutral. You buy down the rate on, on the corporate uh, side to 15 percent, and uh, you reform the personal exemptions, double taxation is a key element, uh, and then the repatriation issues and others, and finally a refundable tax credit. It's revenue neutral, but the consequences on the dynamic side would be an explosive growth. Is, anyone, ask you. is anyone here able to uh, assume anything about compliance and the multiplier effect of, of being willing to say within capital gains, with Mr. to Mr. Delaney's point, is that the 15 percent rate allows people to, uh, or at least makes it easier for people to uh, accept that rate and reinvest that same money, that amount of money in a, in a much shorter period of time, where higher rates cause people to perhaps delay decisions. There's a vast literature on that that suggests that. It varies quite a bit, but it suggests that the revenue maximizing tax rate is above the rates we have right now, so you could raise revenue 
Uh, at least that's the, that's the assumption that the Joint Committee on Taxation would make if they were scoring a capital gains tax increase. May, may I interject just that, that I, I think that, you know, sometimes the perfect is the enemy of the good, but in this tax reform debate, it seems like the mediocre is the enemy of the good. <laughs> that, that we have to face up to the fact, uh, Dr. Gavell mentioned the literature that we're on opposite sides of, that the Joint Tax Committee, frankly, doesn't have a clue how to score a bill that's changing the international tax code because the, the transfer pricing and everything is so complex if, if we reduce the rate three percentage points, I tell you, revenue is going to probably go up. Mm -hmm. uh, but, okay, okay, but the point is that what's going on right now is the Joint Tax Committee is trying to give you a revenue neutral bill uh, based on scoring uh, calls that are essentially impossible for a trained economist to make, and we're tying ourselves in knots to get it to add up to zero rather than just trying to do the right thing and get the rate down. And so, so my suggestion is cut the rate a little bit for three years and see what happens. And if, you, and if your revenue is too low, then do something about it. But, but, but to tie yourselves in nod over these scores that have absolutely no scientific merit seems to me extremely illogical. And we do that pretty well, don't we? Thank you. Thank you. My time's expired. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Former Chairwoman Maloney is recognized. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to all of our panelists. Uh, enjoyed very much your testimony. The title of today's hearing is Lessons uh, Learned uh, from Reagan, and several of my uh, colleagues have referenced his record, but it seems to me if we're going to look at a successful record that uh, turned our economy around and gave us record surpluses, we should be looking at the record of former President Clinton. <laughs> and uh, I, I know that Dr. Tyson, you were the head of the Council of Economic Advisors under that administration and played part of uh, the success that happened for our country uh, during his administration. Uh, we achieved record surpluses, the largest uh, in recent history. We also achieved tax relief for the middle class families, economic growth of almost 4% a year, the creation of over 22 million new jobs, and the lowest unemployment rate this country had seen since 1969. So as a member of that administration, Dr. Tyson, I'd like to know if you'd like to comment on, on that success. And it, and it seems to me that uh, ra if raising individual tax rates uh, inhibited economic growth, it did not seem to do so during the Clinton years. So I'd like to ask you, do you have any evidence that the raising rates on individual rates uh, inhibit economic growth? And could you comment on the success that uh, you were part of achieving uh, the best economy in my lifetime during the Clinton years? Well, I'd certainly love to uh, take credit for that, but uh, I, and I think we did some uh, very sound and wise things. I think it was uh, part of really uh, convincing the country that we had a credible long-run plan to bring the deficit down. It was a balanced plan. It had spending cuts as well as revenue increases. Indeed, I remember the, the concern about uh, the increase in the top rates that, uh, that occurred around the deficit reduction plan. Clearly, I don't think the evidence from what happened afterwards supports those concerns. I want to note, however, because again, I'm, I'm focusing now on the future rather than the past, even though this is a lessons from the past, but I think we really do have to look to the future and the changing environment uh, that we live in. I remember President Clinton talked a lot about uh, globalization, and uh, he talked a lot about falling trade barriers, and he talked a lot about the importance of exports for the U.S. economy. Um, and, you know, if you ask him now, he, he's made it very clear that he thinks the corporate tax rate in the United States should be reduced to 25 percent. Well, actually, we were in a meeting earlier today with uh, President Obama. Mm -hmm. And President Obama was appealing, really, to the Democratic uh, caucus that we needed to lower the corporate tax rate to 28 percent and even lower one for manufacturing, mm -hmm. 25 percent. And mm -hmm. he felt that this would uh, grow uh, our research and development, innovation, uh, mm -hmm. and be a driving force. Uh, so I, I'd like to, Indeed. to hear your, mm -hmm. your response to his proposals that was in his economic speech recently. Mm -hmm. And also, how does it compare to what's happening internationally with our global competitors? Are they moving to this territorial system you okay. were describing earlier where there's mm -hmm. no taxation? Uh, mm -hmm. Could you uh, give a, a, 
a, an overview of the competition that we are we are uh, so an overview with. if in in my longer written testimony I do talk about the overview and, and I can just summarize in the following way uh, every other developed country has moved to what you can call technically a partial exemption system what you can call generally as a territorial system uh, and it's as, as I described in my remarks, which is basically if you are a U.S. headquartered company selling a product abroad, you've set up a subsidiary to sell abroad, and most of the sales of foreign subsidiaries of U.S. companies are actually to sales abroad. They're not to sales in the United States. Uh, you pay the tax in the country. Uh, if you repatriate the earnings, you would not pay the tax here in a territorial system. There is an exclusion, there's a small percent of the, your income that would be taxed, the rest of it would not be taxed. The rest of the countries in the OECD are there. They are just like us though, with a different system. They confront the reality that we got a world economy where a lot of the profits are based on intangible income. Very difficult to price and can be located pretty easily any place in the world. So we do have what you would call base erosion going on, income shifting going on. You can see this in the numbers. You can see that American multinational companies like foreign multinational companies, there's more uh, income uh, in certain places than there's production in certain places. So what's going on? So we have to deal with that. And as I said in my remarks as I was running out of time, uh, Congressman Camp has a very interesting set of options to deal with that. Uh, President Obama has suggested something uh, along these lines. Uh, the the uh, com new commission the OECD is putting together suggested something along these lines. We, we've got to get it done right, but I think we have the opportunity now to do a corporate tax reform which gets it done right and is forward looking. Now, I was very pleased, you know, a year ago, more than a year ago, in February or March of 2012, President Obama's administration put out a business tax reform framework. And the idea there was, as the president said yesterday, and I haven't had a chance to review all the proposals, so I can't give you detail, but I know the basic rubric. It's to bring the corporate rate, rate down to 28, to try to bring it down to 25 for manufacturing, and to make that revenue neutral. Now, he has other ideas about territorial. He, he would not agree with my position on territorial, and that's something that has to be negotiated. But the point is that I think there is broad-based, bipartisan recognition that we are on a path that can get us to a well-designed corporate tax reform. And it would be, to my mind, a real lost opportunity if we let this die because we can't work out other Things. Why, why let impasse on other things be the enemy of the good, the perfect being the enemy of the good? Why not go after the good? We are on a path, I believe, where we can get meaningful corporate mm -hmm. tax reform. Very important for the next, for the future. Very important for jobs and investment in the future. Let's do that. And there I see commonality, a lot of commonality mm -hmm. with what President Obama said yesterday, what President Clinton, former President Clinton is saying about the need to do this. Uh, we should get going and do it. My time has expired, thank you. Good to see you again. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Paulson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, also for holding this hearing. Um, as was mentioned earlier, both from, I think, your outsetting statement as well as from the folks that testified today, the economic numbers that came out today, uh, if anything, show that the economy is not on solid enough footing or our anemic growth levels are such, uh, they are such anemic growth levels that there's a lot more we can be doing to jumpstart our economy and put people back to work. And certainly tax reform, I think many of us really do believe that tax reform is the vehicle to getting our economy back on track and on solid footing. And it's not about doing tax reform for tax reform's sake. It's definitely about making the tax code simpler and fair and more competitive. That is the one word that has really stood out. And as the topic of the hearing talks about looking at past uh, history in terms of, you know, the Reagan tax reform and, and with the Democratic Congress and successes, and no tax reform is perfect. And certainly there were strengths and weaknesses in both the 81 and the 86 tax acts. And I'm wondering if maybe you can just reflect a little bit, um, Dr. Hassel, I'll start with you. What were, what were some of the major strengths and what were some of the major weaknesses? And, and then, Dr. Tyson, you can comment also because you referenced in 1986 we were at the, the lowest the U.S. had the lowest corporate tax rate, and everyone's adjusted since then. You know, how did, how did our actions create sort of a worldwide revolution in tax policy? Um, 
Dr. Hassel. I'll, I'll begin. I think that the, the biggest strength of the 86 Act was the reduction in the individual side marginal rate. Uh, the, uh, I think there were two weaknesses that uh, Dr. Gravel alluded to, one of them, that, that on the corporate side, that basically increased the tax on new capital uh, and to, in order to reduce the tax on old capital. Uh, and there were also a, a number of technical changes to things like passive loss rules that many people attribute uh, to, uh, you know, or think might have caused a, a real collapse in the non-residential real estate market uh, that I think that was like a bigger mess than people anticipated when they wrote the bill. But I, but I, I would say that th those are the pluses and minuses that are the headliners for me. Good. Um, Dr. Tyson? Um, so I, I would like to point out that I think that at the time it would not have been clear uh, exactly how the world was going to change. And, and what I want to emphasize is we had a pretty good, it had pros and cons, and you've heard a couple of them, pretty good tax reform in 1986. But the world is so different now. And it's different because the share of the world's purchasing power out of the United States is so much larger because in every sector of the economy or practically every sector of the economy there are serious new competitors not just from developed countries but from developing countries. So the U.S. companies have had to uh, it, in many cases just to serve those foreign markets have had to move production there, have had to move employment there. Uh, sometimes it's to jump tariff walls. Sometimes it's because companies condition their sales to their customers by being there. Sometimes it's just because you have to design the product better to, by being close to the customers you're selling to. So what's happened here is that U.S. companies, multinational companies, which still locate, still to this day, locate most of their activity in the United States, but a large part of their markets have migrated. And so now they're in a situation where they look at the tax rate in the United States, they look at the tax rate in the other location. That becomes an additional reason to go to the other location. Then they look at the fact that their earnings from the other location are getting much larger a share of their total earnings and they can't bring it back to the United States without paying that additional tax. So we've got to change the system. You know, we, I use in my testimony the word modern. Let's just say it's a, it's realistic. It's the system we have to say this is the world as it is. We, we can't re-engineer the world. We have to reform our tax system to deal with this world. Governor? Yeah. Congress, if I could ask just two quick things. Um, once again, I continue to, to support Dr. Tyson's and her idea of the repatriation of assets because I've seen it in the real world. Uh, what's the rate in Europe? Blended rate in Europe, all these experts, it's 20 percent, isn't it? Yeah, it's 20 percent. Blended OECD rate is in the order of 20, 20, 25, 20 it's actually. But let's say it depends on how you weight it. But so, and we're at 40. So we, we, the point is this. We've got to go below that. That has got to be our goal and our aim and our national objective. And second of all, I'm getting increasingly uncomfortable with this discussion here about siloing the corporate tax rate. We at Free Congress think you have to look at the entire tax code in order to be able to put enough components together to get to your goals and objectives. If you just silo the corporate tax rate, then you get into some argument about how you're going to pay for it. The next thing you know, you don't do anything. And knowing that uh, you know, many small businesses obviously are paying under that individual rate, and that's where a lot of jobs come from. Uh, there are a lot of us that do believe that we cannot leave one off the table without making sure we get our economy on back on solid footing without helping small business. So I yield back. Thank you. First, I want to um, – the Senate's wrapping up its votes, and um, I see Senator Lee is here uh, now, but I would like to insert a Vice Chairman Klobuchar's statement into the record. And on perfect timing, I'd like to recognize uh, Senator Lee uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks to all of you for being with us today. Uh, Professor Tyson, I've got a question for you. When, um, in your testimony uh, that you submitted to the committee, you state that, quote, scoring conventions ignore the stimulative effects of a cut in rate on future growth, close quote. Do you think it would be appropriate for Congress to consider dynamic scoring of uh, corporate tax reform packages? 
I, I'm afraid I have to leave this up to the to the Congress. What my remarks would say, uh, you probably missed uh, Kevin's remark when you were not here. I mean, he said, and I think it's right. We we are all dealing. Economists are dealing, and the Congress is dealing with models of uh, corporate tax effects, which are out of date relative to corporate reality, relative to the mobility of capital income, relative to competitive conditions around the world. So uh, I do believe that the competitive effects of a corporate, of the kind of corporate tax reform that I've been discussing uh, are significantly larger than traditional economic models and dynamic scoring models would allow. What's important for me to emphasize here is that the Alliance for Competitive Taxation and a lot of members of the business community in the corporate sector believe that they're willing to say, we can get to a rate that we think significantly improves our competitive situation, paying for it with getting rid of preferences and credits without dynamic scoring. We don't, we, we, we believe it's gonna be better yeah. than that, but we aren't proposing that you do that. And I think that's an important point. I mean, if you wanna try alternative models, I think that's great, but I think that um, we, the proposal is we can get a competitive tax rate that's paid for by base broadening without making assumptions about the dynamic effects, even though I personally believe in the dynamic effects. Okay, uh, and you personally believe in, in them and, and such that if we were to use them, we'd probably get more accurate scoring, but you're saying we don't have to get there with what you're talking about it, as much as it would be good, much as you would welcome seeing that. Okay. Um, Dr. Hassett, uh, any thoughts you have on dynamic scoring that you'd like to share along those lines? Well, well sure. I, I think that ideally we'd be basing our judgments on the best estimate of what might happen, and we're not doing that. And, and as I uh, said a little bit earlier uh, before you arrived, that, that I think that it ends up creating almost a theater of the absurd where we're using scores that we don't think really have much to do with reality to tie ourselves into knots. Uh, and, and for me, I think that, that absent the score, having a, a new scoring debate and, and establishing new procedures, that, that I think exercising humility on, on both sides and, and being willing to learn is something else that you could do. So, so that, that construct and make a, a small temporary tax change and then watch what happens to revenue and then start to learn how tax changes affect revenues and then collectively decide what the right thing to do is. In, instead, what we're doing is tying ourselves in knots because we can't come up with something that pleases these scoring models that have nothing to do with reality. And that gridlock has been with us really since President Clinton made a very, very small change in the corporate rate while the rest of the world has been cutting its rate. And so we, I think we, we have to fix this system of scoring because it's become an obstacle to competitiveness. Um, uh, back to Dr. Tyson for a minute. Um, in a piece you recently wrote um, in, in Project Syndicate, I think it was in March. You discussed, among other things, the difficulty of doing corporate tax reform comprehensively absent any changes to the treatment of pass-throughs, uh, LLCs or, or other businesses that pay, um, other businesses as to which taxes are typically paid through the individual side of the code. Um, do you think corporate only tax reform is a viable option? And how do you think this would change uh, the competitive position of, of, of small businesses uh, relative to large corporations due to the tax code? Um, let, let me say that uh, I, I did preface that statement with, in Project Syndicate with the observation that I think it is uh, not desirable to have uh, a corporate tax code which uh, distorts choice of organizational form when everything is similar about the organization except whether it checks a S corp or a C corp box. So that's, a, that's an inefficiency from an economist's point of view. Um, I actually think that the best answer to this was again given by my colleague Dr. Hassett who said, you know, if we had a, the right well-designed corporate tax reform with an appropriate rate, a lot of businesses that are currently choosing other organizational forms would choose the corporate form. This is a form choice, and it depends upon the, the, the tax system, and we could get rid of this organizational form 
uh, sort of distortion by one really good form for, and I would say right now it would be called corporate tax form, but a lot of companies would organize in that way. Um, I think that, uh, therefore, what I prefer is to focus on getting the corporate tax reform right, and then that will allow businesses to choose the form of taxation which is the most appropriate for them. Okay. You're saying corporate form is itself a dynamic response? In I, I guess I do. I guess I think that. And, and by the way, I don't, I, I, the governor and I have agreed on a lot of things, but I personally feel that, again, I, since I think we are on the road to possible meaningful, sensible corporate tax reform, and I can see a, the political way to do that perhaps, I would hate to see that get blocked because we're trying to get comprehensive all tax reform and then for forget no tax reform. Thank you. So my time Mr. Chairman, may I answer no. the Senator's question? Very quickly, yes, sir. Senator, the answer is yes. We should consider dynamic scoring. Now, when we put together our program at Free Congress, I asked my economists to do a revenue neutral static approach because I didn't think politically it would be uh, acceptable otherwise. But we all know there's going to be dynamic pluses. And Kevin Hastert's right. Try it. You'll see that it'll work. And then we'll learn something about economics. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. On behalf of Vice Chairman Klobuchar and myself, I want to thank our witnesses. I, I, I get the sense enough is enough with this tax code. You know, it's time to make the tough changes become a competitive again. It's not easy. That's why it's not done but once a generation. But this really is an opportunity to think in a bipartisan way to get this done. So I want to thank the witnesses for their insight, their thought, past experience, just hugely helpful uh, for us at this committee. So again, thank you for being here. Hearings adjourned.